I next invite my dear and beloved brother, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, to give us the concluding address of the evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيد العرب والعجم والناس أجمعين وعلى آله وصحابته ومتبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ما بعد الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has blessed us this evening with some people here that I think we're fortunate, really, all of us. Uh, I'd like to say that I, I didn't uh, feel comfortable, and I never feel comfortable t talking with Sheikh Muhammad al-Yaqubi because he's my sheikh, uh, he's my teacher, and he's actually uh, what I would call a real scholar as opposed to a, uh, an American scholar. <laughs> <laughs> because Americans are good at the spin. So, but uh, he gave me permission so I'm doing that with uh, trepidation. And also Dr. Omar, Abdallah Farouk, who even though he's an American, he's also a real scholar. And, and the other esteemed brothers that are present and sisters. I want to say that we've heard a lot uh, tonight. I've certainly heard a lot. And I've also heard almost everything that I wanted to say. So I don't have anything to say. And I just think that it's amazing how hearts can be united in that way, because I literally heard everything I wanted to say. The same verses I was wanted to talk about already have been talked about in a better way that I could talk about it. So I'm thinking, well, what am I left to do? Just make some uh, closing dua, I think, to be honest with you. I'm not exaggerating, I'm serious. <laughs> it's late. Yeah. Uh, it's New York, they say, the, the city that never sleeps. That's Iblis. <laughs> they, 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 say, they say it's all one to me once you get on this side of the country. It all starts looking the same out there. <laughs> I apologize to people in New Jersey. I know they're upset now. What's he doing comparing us to New York? <laughs> A couple of comments that I don't feel that were covered. One, sacrifice. What does it mean, the word? I agree. In Arabic, you think about it. We don't have a word in Arabic other than sacrificing animals because that's what you do. You sacrifice animals in Islam. But there's an interesting thing about human beings. They're part animal, and that's the sacrifice. You have to sacrifice your nafs. That's what this deen is about, is about sacrificing the nafs. Now, what does sacrifice in, in Latin mean? It's an interesting language. Sacrifice, it comes from two Latin roots, sacris and facere, to make sacred. To make sacred. That is what sacrifice means. We make our souls sacred for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what this deen is about. And this is what humanity has forgotten. And we're here to remind ourselves first and foremost, and then everybody who wants to hear the reminder after that, that we have to return sanctity to the world. The world needs sanctity. It needs to be sanctified by people who are committed to doing what they were created for, which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We were not created. We were not created in vain. We were not created in vain. There's a people in this country that used to worship in a place in, in southern, it's in Arizona, it's called Chama Canyon. Chama Canyon has been studied by anthropologists in this country for uh, several decades and nobody could work out what this place is. There's no bones there. It's a, it's a, there's several buildings and they don't, they didn't understand what it was. They were trying to work out what is this place? What were they doing in this place? And then one day there was a, an anthropologist who was up in one of the sites and she was studying some hieroglyphs that were in the walls in, in, in carved in the stones on the top of this valley. And suddenly she saw a light flash between two stones in the back and it cut right down the middle of this, it was like a bullseye, a s several circles, concentric circles. 
and it went right down the center of this, this, uh, this glyph. And this woman had studied astronomy, and she suddenly thought, my God, is this an astronomical symbol here? And so she thought about it, and indeed, the day was the equinox. Now, the equinox is the day when there's 12 hours of the day and 12 hours of the night. It occurs twice a year in the areas that there are 45 degree, uh, 23.5 degrees south of the equator and 23.5 degrees north of the equator. You get twice a year, you'll get an equinox where you have the same number of, of hours in the night as you have in the day. They began to reassess their whole understanding of this Chama Canyon. And what they found out was the entire place was lined up astronomically. Everything was lined up astronomically. They found out that it was lined up to the lunar, to the, the, the moonrise and the moonset. It was lined up to the sunrise and the sunset. And all of the rooms were designed in order to t tell the people there what time of day it was. Now, people can say, people don't understand this anymore because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, awalam tara ila rabbika kayfa madda dhul. Haven't you looked at your Lord, how he moves the shadow? Walaw sha'ada ja'aluhu sakina. And had he wanted, he would have made it remaining in one place. But he didn't. He made it move. And that's one of the signs of the existence of God, the movement of shadows. And the ancients were very concerned about the movements of shadows. Now they asked all these anthropologists with their PhDs, were trying to work out what these people were doing there. Well, they went out and, and interviewed uh, one of the Hopi Indians. He doesn't have a PhD. He's just a, a, a Hopi Indian out there. And they said, what was this place? And he said, well, those ancient people looked up at the heavens and they saw a perfect order. And they wanted to bring that order down to the earth. So they aligned their lives to be in harmony with the heavens. And he said, we've forgotten about that. And that's why there's all this chaos and disorder in the world. And when they forgot about the order of the heaven and maintaining it on the earth, it was taken away from them. And that's why they're no longer here. That is reality. That's the way it works. The Kaaba is astronomically aligned. There's a lot of people that don't know that. The Kaaba is astronomically aligned to the star Suhail. Suhail is called Canopus. It's in the constellation of Carina. Now, interestingly enough, spacemen, astronauts don't use the North Star when they go out of the Earth's orbit. They use Suhail. It's the star that they use to make sure that they're on course when they get out into the heaven. The Kaaba is Methaba. It's a sacred place. It's a sanctuary. It's called Al-Haram. Haram means sanctuary. You know what the Turks called their houses? They had two places in the house. One was called Salamlek and the other was called Haramlek. Salamlek was where you greeted people. They came in, it's the place of Salam. Haramlek was the sanctuary. That was where the family resided. In, in the West they call it Harim and they have all these fantasies about it. The truth is, there's no fantasy. They were just people in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what's so mysterious to the Western people. What were they doing in the haram? They were worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even when they were under the covers. They were worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those people were in a state of harmony with the heavens. And that's what it is. We've been given a mandate from heaven. One of the great Chinese scholars of Islam wrote a seerah of the Prophet Muhammad and talked about during one of the Chinese dynasties, the emperor sent a delegation of Chinese to Medina. And they met with Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. And Sayyidina Umar said to them, go back to your emperor and tell him that the mandate from heaven 
has come once again to the earth and it's time for you to realign yourselves. We were speaking in the language of the Confucians to the people of Confuji. Because Confucius said that the world is here in order for us to bring heaven to the earth. As above, so below. And that is what sacrifice is about. It's about making sacred the mundane. The sacred lives of our people were embedded in their pottery. And their pottery is now sold in the, the auctions of the world for tens of thousands of dollars. Vessels that they drank from. Their books that they copied are now sold by Sotheby's for $50,000 and $100,000 because they made sacred the word of God. If you see the Qur'ans that they wrote, it will make you weep because those people knew what the Qur'an was. وَمَنْ يُعَظْمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ And those who exalt the sacred symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is from the taqwa in their hearts. It's from the consciousness of God and the consciousness of the heavens in the hearts of heavenly people living and tarrying on the earth for a short time only retur to return to the heavens. That is what sacrifice is about. It's about making sacred the mundane. It's about aligning your lives to the prayer. When I lived in Mauritania, one of the things that struck me more than anything else is that their lives revolved around the prayer. The prayer was not fit into their schedules. Their schedules were in order that the prayer could be done properly, on time, with all of its requisite conditions. The prayer is at the essence of this community. As-salah imadu deen on the deathbed of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, As-Salah, As-Salah, your prayer, your prayer. What is the prayer other than bringing the sacred back into the day, constantly reorienting ourselves, reorienting our hearts to the Qibla that Allah has given us, not that our nafs, hawa, shaitan, and dunya have given us. And this is what we need to do. These people have forgotten this. They were once people that actually knew that God existed. They were people that blessed their food before they ate it. They were people that had an understanding of, of the day of judgment. They've forgotten all of this and look at them. Look at these people. Look at what shaitan is doing to humiliate them. And it's our responsibility to take it back again to these people. To remind them that they're God's creatures. That they need to cover their nakedness that this is something that honors them. It's something that dignifies the human being. It's something that even aboriginal peoples know. Even aboriginal peoples know that you cover your nakedness. As so atani. And the, the hallmark of civilization, the hallmark of civilization is modesty. It's propriety. It's understanding the place of individuals in the world and the place of, of, of individuals in their societies, that each person is an essential element of the society and is contributing to make that society a place conducive to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Arnold Toynbee, the English historian, said that the spirit of civilization is religion. It's the ruh that animates civilization. And if you take religion out of any civilization, then it's hell-bent for destruction. It's hell-bent for destruction. It's headed for destruction and suppression. We saw a sign today on the way here. It said, play, work soft, play hard. It was an advertisement. This is what shaitan is telling these people. Work soft and play hard. This is what they're doing. They're reduced. Today, the, the newspaper, the ma major story was the Super Bowl, front page, major story. And in the back, in the business section, Greenspan said, we're in big trouble. <laughs> this is bread and circus of the Romans. Absolutely. It's bread and circus. Give them bread and give them circus. And whenever things got hard for the Roman politicians, what did they do? They gave them more bread and more circus. This is what they do in Ramadan now in the Muslim countries. They say the best television programs are in Ramadan. Well, that's because the Iblis is behind the programming. And that's why they call it programming. 
because you're being programmed. <laughs> and he's the programmer. He's behind it all. They had a cartoon in an American newspaper of a guy opening a door that said tech support and he opens it and it was hell and there was the devil behind the computer with all the wires coming down there and it said now I understand the internet. <laughs> I mean, even their cartoonists can see it. And cartoonists in this country are the only people that are allowed to say the truth. The only real news in the newspapers is in the cartoons. Because they're the court jesters. Court jesters were characters that were allowed to say the truth to the king because they were considered fools. And this is why the cartoon, they'll tell the truth in the cartoons. Really, Trudeau and all these characters and Tom Tomorrow. These guys are the only, Tom Tomorrow, if you want real news, just read Tom Tomorrow. He's the only serious news analyst in America, as far as I'm concerned, and he's a cartoonist. I, I'm not making that up. I'm really serious. These people, the, look at the, we have the solution to the, the, to the crises of this country, and we should want to salvage this country. There's no reason why we should want to see this country destroyed. There's all these Muslims, and, and, and it's troubling for me because I'm living here, but they're all saying, Allahumma dammar America, Allahumma shattid shamlahum, Allahumma armil nisa'ahum, Allahumma armil nisa'ahum, Allahumma yattim awladahum. I mean, I'm hearing it in the massage, and I'm thinking, man, I had a Mauritanian sheikh, I was in the middle of the desert, and he was saying, Allahumma asqit ta'iratihim min as samai And I said, yeah, Sheikh, and I arkav out of Tilka Tairat. I ride on those planes. He said, Ma Valik, Maya Suluka. That it's not gonna if you're on the plane, it's okay. <laughs> Seriously, we have to we have to realize we've got things to do here. You know, when I was in I was recently in in Arabia and there was a, a deaf person came into the room and there was a person there and I started talking to him through this interpreter. And I, and he said, Where's he from? And he said he said, uh, Sheikh Abdullah al said he's from America. So he went like this. And I said, what was that? And he said, that's America. In Arabic, sign language. I said, what does that mean? He said, you know, cowboys, like shoot them. <laughs> and... That's America. If you want to sign for America to a deaf Arab, you say, we want to change that. Really, these people need to get that chance. I said, well, how do you say English? And he said, and I said, why? He said, because of BBC, they're always talking. And then he asked me where I was going. I said, first, and then. <laughs> But that's, that really bothered me. That he, that's what he said. That's America. Shoot them up. Bang, bang. That's what they do. Just go in, nuke them. That's a good American phrase. We ought to nuke the whole lot of them. Those sand Arabs. We ought to nuke them. Ragheads. They developed the neutron bomb for the, for the Arabian Peninsula. People really, I'm not making that, they developed the neutron bomb. Because the neutron bomb kills all the people and leaves the oil refineries standing. It was designed to solve the problem of not destroying the infrastructure. So you can kill all the people and you can still wait a little while until all that nuclear fallout dissipates and then you go in and get your oil. What is that? This is a sickness of the mind. Their children, our children, their children, our children, a lot of Muslim children are watching daily television, violence on TV. It's haram in Sharia to watch a person being killed. It's haram to watch that. Unless it's for the hudud. And there, a group of believers are supposed to watch it as a deterrent. But it is actually haram to go and see things like that. To watch torture, any of these type things. This is desensitization. In this country now, we have daily acts of, of violence that we can't understand anymore. They don't even have a frame of reference. They have a, a, a Lieutenant Colonel, Dave Grossman, who wrote a book called On Killing. And it's worth reading this, because he, he's written some very important material. This man taught the psychology of killing at West Point. And he said basically what they're doing now in videos is they are training children to become assassins. Because the 
army uses the exact same desensitization techniques for training assassins in the army. The same technique. They have policemen. You want to know why Ahmed Diallo was killed? You go look how they train the policemen. They train them on video games. Did people know that? They train them on video games. They don't, see, it used to be in the old days, uh, they didn't train people to, to react. They trained them to think. Because that's what you want. You wanted a policeman who, who thought before he acted. Like harrab. The idea of thinking before you act. Because to kill a human being is not a simple thing. And anybody who's ever done it, and there might be somebody in this room who's done it. Anybody who, who's ever killed a human being knows what that means. I met a man who was a, a, an assassin in Vietnam. He became Muslim. And he told me that he was trained to kill people only when he saw their faces. He blew their heads off. And I asked him, he killed many people. He, and I asked him once, I said, do you ever see those faces? He said, every night. Every night. This, this, what's happening out here? We had, do, do, do people know who Brian Wilson is? Not the beach boy. Do people know who Brian Wilson is? He's a Vietnam vet who started an organization an anti-war organization. He lost his legs because he, he laid on tracks for a, 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 a train that was taking military hardware that would be taken to Nicaragua to kill Sandinistas. He put his body on the tracks and because the FBI warned the conductor about terrorists there, the conductor ran over this man's legs and cut his legs off. He lectures now. The man who was assigned by the FBI to watch this man actually ended up quitting the FBI and joining this man's organization. And they lectured together. This ex-FBI agent and this ex-Vietnam vet. What this Vietnam veteran said was his job in Vietnam was to assess the successful bombing missions. What that meant was he had to go into villages and see what the death count was. Because that's how successful the bombing mission was, how many people were killed. And when he came back to this country, he became a lawyer, and for 10 years he said he never talked about what he saw, but he lived with it every single night. He lived with it every single night of his life. And then he became a counselor to Vietnam veterans in Boston. And he began, every time that he would counsel these vets, they would end up basically just crying together. I know a man who drives a taxi in the Bay Area who told me every night he drives home Vietnam veterans in this country who weep after getting drunk in a bar. And they say, do you know what we did? There have been more Vietnam veterans have killed themselves than soldiers died on the American sides fighting in Vietnam. Suicide rates. You think it's easy to go and tyrannize people? You think that's an easy thing to be an oppressor? It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. They suffer. And that's why we have to give victory to the oppressed and to the oppressor. And the way we give victory to the oppressor is to stop him from his oppression. And that's our role in this country. And if we're silent about it, then we're cowards. And that's what we are. And if you're not willing to speak out for the truth and take the consequences, then you're in the wrong religion. Because that's what this religion is about. It's about standing up for the truth. And the greatest shaheed is the one who speaks the truth in front of unjust authority. It's not the one who goes out and kills a bunch of people. It's the one who speaks the truth in the face of unjust authority. That's what the shaheed is. In this deen, that is the highest shahada. Kerimatul haq and the sultan in jail. And we need to speak the truth because we're still living in a country where you're permitted to speak the truth. You're permitted. They will do things, and we know that, but that's not our concern. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wali al amanu. We're not here to blow up anything. I'm in this country, mustatman. 
I'm in this country. I'm not here to blow up anything. I'm not here to kill anybody. I'm not here to subvert anything other than the dominant paradigm. That's all I'm interested in subverting. I'm interested in subverting Kufa. And that's what we're here to do. If you want to do something else, then you make Hijra from this country. You make Hijra from this country and you go to another place. But as long as you're in this country, your job in this country is to spread peace and spread the truth. When the Messenger of God وسلم, went to Medina, Abdullah ibn Saddam, the great Jewish rabbi who became Muslim, went to hear the words and he said, the first words I heard from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, were, he said, the first thing he noticed, he said, Ma kana wajhuhu wajha kadhab. His face was not the face of a liar. And this is called firasa because the Arabs knew firasa. They knew what a good face was and a bad face. And then he sat and listened to the words and the first thing the Messenger of Allah said, Ya yuhan nas, afshu salam. Oh humanity, spread peace. Wa at'imu ta'am and feed food. And pray in the night when people are sleeping. And you'll enter paradise in security and in peace. That's the message of Islam. 50% of the world's population are living below the poverty lines. They're living in slums. They're living in slums. Most people on this planet don't even have proper water to drink. We're in ni'mah. I mean, this, look, look at this ni'mah. When I was in Mauritania, this is black. That's what color it is. And that's what people drink there. And you know what they say when they finish? Alhamdulillah. That's what they say. They say, Alhamdulillah. Look at this ni'mah. How are we going to do the shukr of this ni'mah? Really, how are we going to make shukr for all this ni'mah that we're in? And this is getting, every day is getting faster and faster. Faster means you're going down. That's what it is. When you're getting faster, it means you're headed down. This country is going to crash. And if you're here, you better be prepared. We better be prepared as a community to recognize this country is headed for a big crash. And if you don't think so, you haven't read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You haven't read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The British were the only power in the world in the late 19th century. They were the only power. They were the sole power in the world in the late 19th century. They feared no one. The British Empire, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Rule Britannia. Britannia rules the ra waves. Rule Brit Britannia. We'll never, never, never be slaves. That's what the English said. The sun never sets on the British Empire. Well, what they forgot was America, after the sun sets on England, it rises on America. And when there was a Libyan woman who I know went to a, a British embassy to get a, 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 a transit visa to America, he said, go get your visa from America first and then may, we'll give you one. And she said, Meta asbahat Britannia thenaban li Amerika. Since when did England become a tail for America? And see, she's an intelligent woman. Akhadatu al He got like, you know, jealous. So he said, okay, we'll give you one. I'm not going to let America do that. But see, that's just Amani. Britain, Britain, really, what, what is England now? I mean, they're in crises. They're in big crises. And this country's all coming. It's all coming. And this is the sunnah of Allah in His creation. So let us change our lives now. Really, become people. We have things to do in this country. We can change the, 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 the face of this nation. We can. The Muslims can do that. We have the power to do that by, by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have the truth on our side. We have every atom, every molecule, every planet, every angel behind us. We have, it's all behind us. But we have to be ibadullah. That's what we have to be. That's the only condition to get all of creation working for us. That's the only condition. That's all creation wants to see is that we're indeed servants of Allah. And if we do that, the creation will come behind us. You will see miracles. Just as those who went before us saw miracles. They saw miracles. When Muhammad Alexander Webb, somebody asked him, Rahimahullah, somebody asked him, do you really think you can take Islam to the American people? He said, you, you talk as if this is my work. This is God's work. 
This isn't my work. This is not about Muhammad Alexander Webb taking Islam to America or Zaid Shakur or Siraj Wahaj or Hamza Yusuf or Fulan Wa'alan or anybody else. This is about the deen of Allah, the creator of the heavens and, and the, uh, the entire universe. This is the deen of Allah, lest we forget. We are the people of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the best of creation. And if you want to know sacrifice, sacrifice, and I'll use a baseball metaphor, because the first hit I ever got in college, in, in high school baseball, and I remember it because people remember things like that, was a sacrifice bunt. That was the first time I ever got a hit. I made a sacrifice bunt. You know what a sacrifice bunt is? That means you give up your... You get out in order to advance somebody else. And that's the spirit of this deen. We are people that we want to advance the deen, not ourselves. And if it means from time to time getting out of the way, then we get out of the way. We get out of the way. It's not about me or you or anybody else. This is the deen of Allah. And at the head of this deen is the best of creation. And that's why Zubair ibn Awam, if you want to know sacrifice, Zubair ibn Awam radiallahu once took off his shirt to change it, and a man saw over 70 wounds on his body. And he said, where did you get those, those wounds from? And he said, shielding the messenger of Allah. Shielding, the, he was a human shield. Now these people here, they have to do deep brainwashing when they get these, these people to to protect the president, jump in front of the president. You know how long they brainwash them to do that? Because that is against every instinct in a human being. They do, they do behavioral conditioning to get them to do that. They train them down in Langley and other places, and they make them do all these things. When they hear boom, boom, they jump in front. They have to learn that to be conditioned like a Pavlovian dog. That's what they do. And then when they hear the shot, they just jump in front. And, and the president, and if, if the CIA's calling the hit, sometimes they'll duck a little bit, let the bullet go by. <laughs> That's what happened to Rabin, right? Rabin, they, they opened up his back. They opened it up. You can see it in the film. I saw the film. They opened up his back. Boom. And then their secret service said, it's only blanks. That's what they shouted. It's only blanks. Leah Rabin, the, the Jewish wife of Rabin said, I would rather my children marry Palestinians than some Jews. Because she knew who killed her, herself with that mandate. 